Is this the last day of interviews for you? Oh, God, no. It's been going on for three weeks every morning at between 8.30 and 9. And, uh, oh, my. And uh, then the, the next, it's just been European so far, so the next week is when the North American starts. I'm saying to the guy who does promo, too, it's talking about yourself all day <laughs> results in a really specific type of psychosis. Yeah, I was thinking this earlier. I was thinking... The guy's been talking about this stuff for a long time. Now, do we do a super kind of therapy, let's get inside your head interview, or should we just have a chat and just keep it light? It's entirely up to you. Uh, I prefer, I prefer, I don't, I'm not a big fan of small talk, so. Oh, right. Uh, okay. That's, yeah. that's good. I, I didn't want to kind of, I don't know, get too deep and kind of end up like a therapy session for you, but. No, that makes it easier. The, uh, the stuff that melts my brain is, why is it two records? And, uh, you know, the stuff that, yeah. that's made off of the uh, bio, yeah. So hit me, go for it. Okay, cool. Um, so you're busy. You've been doing a lot, haven't you? <laughs> the Casualties of Cool, the Z2 album, and then shocking amounts of touring, and then no pressure at the Royal Albert Hall. So... Um, do you work like that generally? Are you kind of a all or nothing kind of person? Well, everything that I do is, is essentially a, a reflection of the frame of mind I find myself in, and um, uh, I just have no peripheral. I have this inability to see what's going on while it's happening. So typically, I make music not only the byproduct of like the process of, of trying to be functional, but also it gives me something objective to look at after the fact and say, oh, well, that's what you were feeling. That's what it was. Like, you were pissed off or you were afraid or, or you were sad or whatever it is. It's, it's just, I, I, it's like a, it's like sort of a, uh, working towards a better state of emotional intelligence because in the present, I just, I have a hard time identifying what it is that I'm feeling. But if I'm on autopilot, I can just go for it. So, you know, the state that I've been working in and the, and the level in which I've been functional for the past five to seven years has been uh, a result of a lot of things. You know, a result of uh, quitting smoking weed or drinking or, or whatever. But that addictive nature just goes in, in other directions. And now that Z2 is done and that process is just so chaotic, it's increasingly clear to me that, that things need to change. I mean, it hasn't hit a wall. It hasn't been to the point where I'm exhausted, like technically or burnt out technically, but it's threatening to be so. And because it's all essentially by my own hand, now's the time to sort of look at Z2 and casualties and say, okay, so next, you can tour it, but just be a little more selective when it comes to the, the amount of things you take on. Yeah, yeah, that's that's healthy though, I think, isn't it? Especially in the industry that you're in, it's uh, Very much. it's, it's a, a healthy thing to kind of take stock and go right. Maybe some time to reflect, and that's just yeah, as important, I think. That's it. I mean, I think the thing with the whole process is, is yeah, you're, you're trying to become like anybody, really. Hopefully, you're just trying to become a better version of yourself, and I think that the pitfalls with the industry, uh, you know, for, for someone like my, uh, someone like myself as well is, is, uh, it's easy to get a false sense of, of uh, self-importance when you're doing this stuff because, you know, you're, you're talking about yourself for weeks. Mm-hmm. It's this, the process becomes just so, uh, exaggerated to the point where you're talking about it as a process. You're talking about, uh, yourself as uh, a product or in third person and, and essentially what happens is, is your art or music or interactions with people reflect it. it it's just the narcissism and all but you know I think that in the same sense it's 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 a learning tool if you can if you can uh, you know harness it or choose to harness it and then potentially the stuff that happens next in my career, any artist's career will just continue to get better. I mean, that's the hope, right? Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Do you think that you, if you weren't Devin Townsend and you weren't, uh, 
the musician and the creator and the composer and producer and all of the things creatively that you do do you think if you were I don't know a doctor or a lawyer or had a different profession do you think that you would approach things in the same way because you have that personality well maybe I think that there's a compulsive part of my personality that would benefit any of those kind of professions but the one thing that I think uh uh, help, helps me define the musical thing is, is vision. I mean, that's what I've had since the beginning, and that's why I've chosen to produce and mix and, and write and all these things. It's, it's less about being an unmitigated control freak, <laughs> although that's definitely a part of it, but it's, uh, it's, it's really that I have a, uh, an image in my head of the emotion or the feeling that I want the music to to leave myself and whoever listens to it in. And really the path there requires a real uh, connection to that vision or else you're just sort of grasping in the dark. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so I don't know if that, if that is something that necessarily applies to doctors or or surgeons or, or lawyers or things. Perhaps it does, I don't know, but... Uh, but yeah. it's ultimately a benefit to what I do because it allows me to really have a goal from a, a, an early part of the process. Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's a facet. I think I find musicians fascinating. I'm not a musician, so it's always interesting to me how you can kind of emotionally reflect kind of how you're feeling at that moment in music, which is which is a really foreign thing to most non-musicians. Like, how do you get from a tune in your head or a, a, a concept uh, especially in your case the big production and the, the the fullness of it like how do you get to that point like what's the spark like do you have a particular I think the spark is a moment of emotional significance whatever that is and then really from there on out it's for me at least it's it's about autopilot it's about allowing it to sort of manifest uh, and just follow your gut like each decision will uh, affect the next one so as a result of that you just have to make sure that it all kind of lines up and, and every now and then you'll get uh, you'll get sidetracked and you'll go down the wrong the wrong avenue but um, you just back up and and uh, refine it but I also think to a certain extent and this is a thought that I've been trying to uh, see how I feel about because I, I actually don't know but there's a part of me that thinks that the mentality of artistry is akin to mental illness on some level. Mm. Where it's, you know, it's uh, the compulsion to to do these things is is so um, all encompassing that, but there's really no there's really no function for it other than you know, perhaps a need for validity on the worst sense or some sort of uh, uh, wanting to share something that was spiritually significant or whatever on the other end of the spectrum, right? But mm. but either way, it's, it's, you know, I wonder if, if you get to the point as a person where you no longer feel the need for that validation. But then again, maybe on the other side of it, maybe it's about sharing. Maybe it's about uh, trying to communicate things that are uh, important and you're privy to as a as a result of your your, your trip and and wanted to share it. But I think for me the whole process is about just, just trying to understand the motivations for it all. And it, it it lies beneath and it's just so easy to have that um, to misinterpret it on your own front as being like altruistic or something when mm-hmm. ultimately you just have a ton of issues, right? I think um I think it's really interesting. I definitely think it's interesting and yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a powerful thing. Does does it get exhausting to think like that, though? Do do you have moments where you think, oh, let's just do nothing and not think and not have those moments for a little bit? Well, I, some people are wired to be able to do that, and I don't know if I am. I mean, I try and I try and uh, practice meditating and relaxing and, and all this sort of stuff, but I'm. I'm pretty high strung in a lot of ways and the, and the process of thinking about these things that I, I do is, you know, I, 
at the age of 42, it, it's, I just kind of submit to it rather than, rather than fight it. I mean, I spent a good deal of my life and career sort of defending the way that I think and process things because it might be perceived as peculiar or over the top in terms of analysis or whatever. But, you know, 42, I got families and life and career and, and I'm comfortable with it. It doesn't, I mean, there's times where it will, it will spiral into places that are unhealthy, but for the most part, it's I think the same way about food and mowing the lawn as I do about uh, music or, or anything, so just roll with it, right? Yeah, definitely. Think, yeah, I mean, the, yeah. To, to get to the point where you're creatively and emotionally at peace and they both coexist in the same space, I think... That's the ultimate, I think, isn't it? Especially if you yeah. have that kind of mind that just doesn't work in that way. That's it. And it's, it's like at a certain point, you spend more energy chastising yourself for being who you are than just getting on with it. You know, it's like, if, if it takes you an extra couple of seconds to choose what you're going to have for dinner because of a certain way of analysis <laughs> or whatever, then just roll with it. It doesn't matter. It's, as long as you're not affecting anybody negatively, I think you're good to go. Yeah, totally. Totally. I think, um, so with the Z2 album and the tour and all of the crazy stuff that's happening right now, are you, uh, has, has the Z2 album, has that kind of put things to bed for you? Are you happy with it and feel that, uh, it's your most kind of complete because you sound like you're in a good place as opposed to the other, other times in your life, maybe where things have been more complicated or, uh, more difficult. Do you, do you think that, yeah, you're at peace I'm with things now? Place. I'm in a fine place. And I think that the reason is just because it's just like, without me you just submit to it. It's, I'm in a fine place because the option is, there's not, I mean, what other place you're going to be? I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm doing my thing. So to be upset or stressed about it, I mean, I am upset and stressed about a ton of things, of course, but but it's not debilitating. It's it's part of the job, right? And I think that, um, uh, of course, yeah, of course I'm happy to be too. It's great. It's, it's, uh, is it the most engaging record that I've ever done for people? I mean, I don't know. I think that for me, as long as it accurately represents what it's supposed to represent, then my job is technically done, and it does. It perfectly represents it. And I think that the the best analogy that I've heard recently was if your if your artistic mind is like a sponge, whatever you soak up when you wring it out is what the product's going to be. Yeah. You know, so if you you soak up milk, you're going to wring it out and you're going to get a record like that. If you soak up piss, you're going to wring it out and it's going to, it's going to be like that, right? And um, my life recently, by my own hand, has just been incredibly chaotic and and frustrating as a result of that. And, and there's a lot of conflicting emotions and conflicting moments and conflict in general. And so that's what this record is. It's just... That's of course that's what it's going to be, you know. Yeah. So, as long as it's accurate, then then we're going to go on it totally. Is. See, with um, those moments where it's conflicting, and you're like everyone else, just when things get confusing or conflicting or chaotic or uh, stressful, what's the thing that you do to keep yourself motivated and not just go, oh, fuck this, I'm going to go and I don't know go and live in the desert or something and just stop? Like, what's the thing? Well, maybe maybe that thought is what keeps me going. You know, <laughs> yeah. I'll just, I'll just stop for 10 minutes and then have a talk and make all these elaborate fantasies about running away from it. Yeah. And then you get out of the top and you do it. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I don't know. Uh, I, think that, I think that anybody is going gonna, is gonna to have those fucking, this is fucking retarded moments. And I mean... I think that's part of it, and, and to, to pretend that you're above that or that it doesn't apply to you or whatever, it's just, it's ridiculous. I mean, you know, I've been married for 25 years. I'm sure you know the scenario. You just, you, the amount of times you're just saying, oh, I'm going to go live on my own, and that's it. <laughs> Many times. <laughs> and then you don't, then you get on with it, 
it, right? Yeah. When you have an arm cross discussion and realize it's the same shit you've been dealing with for 25 years, and then, you know, when you do the dishes, I mean, it's like, it's it's life, I guess, and it's, it's got to the point where, again, however you get by is totally fine, and how you get by it is swearing that, you know, if you're going to move to Arctic, to the Antarctic or whatever, then do you think that um i've sort of read in other interviews with you about uh weed and drugs and that kind of life do you think because i've sort of spoken to musicians a lot about this particular thing um do you think that having given up weed do you think that you approach writing music in a different way yeah i don't think i'm as precious about it mm. which is great if i think that i was high i would I would write something and be so fascinated by it that I would just hold on to it. It would take me forever to write. Yeah. Because I'd write a riff and then I'd just be like, oh, it's so fucking wicked. And then I would, you know, have nine bong rips and five cups of coffee and just sit on the stairs playing that riff for a week. <laughs> and then, that, then that's all the song was. And be like, and then by the time I got to meeting other parts, I'd be over it and I'd have no more material for it. So... You know, it was, it, the process was a lot more, um, yeah, well, it's like just holding on to it. It's like I didn't want to let it go. And then we have kids and, and, you know, sobriety and all these things. And you just, for me, I just kind of got to a point where I was like, well, I'm so lucky to do music. It's great. I mean, holy crap. Like, the amount of jobs that I could have had and the one that I ended up with, it's it's like a dream in so many ways and so do you still so, feel like that like you know do you still feel that you have those moments where you have to pinch yourself and think shit like I well, get to I do mean, this every day to clarify it all the part of my job that I have to pinch myself because I can't believe I'm so fortunate to do it is the creative aspect of it mm. the logistic part of my world is, is it's akin to a desk job in, in a lot of ways because I wake up and I answer 40, 60 emails and, and then interviews and then, uh, you know, moving gear and then it's, so a lot of, a lot of, obviously moving gear can be best job, but a lot of what I do is really an uncreative pursuit. But when I'm able to just start um, writing, I mean, that's like, Five percent, ten percent of your job is the greatest thing ever. You know, so it's it's uh, it's uh, it's it's wonderful. And in those moments, yeah, I'm like, holy shit! It's ten in the morning, and I'm playing guitar with coffee. This is awesome, <laughs> right? Do you, then, do you think that's changed day? from when you were a kid and you kind of got to do that? You know, pick up your know, wake up in the morning, pick up your guitar, play your guitar, kind of listen to. I don't know, Maiden or whatever you were listening to when you were a kid, like, do you still feel like that now? Do you still feel that you've m managed to maintain the the kid musician in yourself? Well, that's where Zilcoid comes in, I guess. Yeah. Because he represents, like, the childish thing and, and allowing it to sort of manifest. And it's funny for me to hear it because it's so childish, right? But, I mean, again, it's... it's those moments of playing guitar at 10 in the, 10 in the morning is, 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 is there's a sobering reality to the rest of it where for a month straight you don't really play guitar at all. Mm. You know, it's like you, it's, it's, I mean, three weeks of interviews like all day. And then the set up of the, of the band and yesterday we filmed a bunch of puppet stuff which is great. Again, I mean, it's awesome, right? But it's still, it's, it's exhausting in ways that, that, you know, you don't anticipate when you see it from the outside, like, so all these things are, are it's a very interesting job, and, uh, and I, I mean, again, I can't overstate how thankful I am for the opportunity to do that, but that, that acknowledgement of it right there requires that you keep your head on straight, you know, you don't let it go in directions that are going to screw yourself, because it always ebbs and flows, and Right now, things are kind of rolling high for me, but eventually it'll just, it'll dip. And at that point, unless you've managed to sort of maintain your relationships and these things within it, you're, you're going to be fucked, right? So, mm. Do you think that 
that the the answering emails and the endless interviews and the logistical side of being a musician do you do you feel that it's got more complicated over the last few years with you know Spotify and iTunes and Twitter and the internet and the complexities of music same sort of sense I guess that I don't know <clears throat> that's cool that you're able to sort of maintain control because I think a lot of musicians just don't want to do it so much that they don't and then they're not able to creatively do exactly what they want to do and you're in a luck lucky position yeah. I suppose that you are able to I'm do that just, I'm lucky based on circumstance though it's not necessarily like a uh, a life skill that I came into this scenario with. Mm. I've been fortunate enough to have people around me that have kind of forced me to learn these things and mm. have insisted that I learn these things, right? So, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, just, it's an interesting period right now because it is kind of on the, the precipice of being, of being one thing and then, and then, you know, what it wants to become. So we'll see. And again, V2, the, the, the the result of this period, like all this stuff that we're talking about, that's what the record's about. It's even if it's not conceptually about that, the energy of it is, is that. It's this this over the top, complex, kind of confusing thing that I think is well done, right? Yeah. I yeah. I'm I'm really excited about it. I think uh my little boy, like I said before, he's nine and he's just got into metal. Um and this is a particular record that I'm really excited about introducing him to. Not because he's nine, but because it's something I know that, I don't know, it will kind of spark creativeness in him and his imagination. And I think that's, that's an incredibly rare thing to find in metal when metal can generally be quite negative and something I, I don't know, I kind of I wouldn't ask him to shy yeah, away that's, from. But that's, I'm really glad to hear that because honestly, I put a ton of effort into trying to make sure it's not negative and also because there's lots of kids in my world as well I, you know, I tried to make sure there's no swearing on it as well you. Like <laughs> I really yeah, genuinely I really appreciate that because it's you know metal's like my love too and sometimes I think oh this record is so good and oh but it's got laser swearing in it and and I'm really it's, it's great to have an album that isn't like that but still has that essence of like rebellion it's great yeah. Well, that was good, but like, even with, with the kids in my world, I was like, you know, I want them to listen to this. I want my sister's kids to listen to this. And, and they won't be allowed to, you know, you know, talking like a sailor, right? So, yeah. so yeah. We, we kept it like that. And I mean, even there's been criticism, not even criticism, or, or you know, observation. Observation, yeah. The audience that, yeah, but that the lack of that is, you know, makes the character not as engaging for all the people. But in my mind, I'm just like, he's the top edge. <laughs> That's well, amazing. I mean? If you're like, you're a 50 year old man, just go listen to something else. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's a top edge. 
kids are really going to like this. Like, you know, I'm not directing this part of my creative mind towards 50 year old men. I'm thinking kids would like it, you know? And if that's sort of a target for you, then cool. you know, don't yeah, totally. Have it down like you want to see the whole time, you know? Like, Just sort of carrying on from that whole concept, the Royal Albert Hall show promises big things. What what things do you have planned for the Royal Albert Hall? I can't tell you. You can't tell me. <laughs> I can't tell you. <laughs> we started the conversation last night and, and it's awesome. It's awesome. We've got some parameters like we have to only, we can only get there to set up the morning up so we have to make sure that it's all modular and but um, basically, we're going to play the full record of the Dark Matter stuff and illustrate it in very um, peculiar ways. Right? It's a beautiful but, uh, building. It's a beautiful building to do it in as well, which, that's a big yeah, thing. The Royal Albert Hall is a huge deal. Yeah, it's great. You know, it's awesome. And I mean, the selling it with, with parting aliens is, is uh, you know, a cost that I don't take lightly, you know. Yeah, I'm sure it's something that will never have happened inside that building before, I should think. No, absolutely. No. I'm, I'm, I mean, the more I talk about it, the more I realize the, the, uh, the, the breadth of it and the, you know, and the, and the uh, amazing history that the place has. But really, I can't spend too much time thinking about that right now because I can't be intimidated by it. i got to figure it out, right? So. Yeah. Okay, I think our time's nearly up, so I'll just ask you one last question. Um, what have you learned about yourself in the last 18 months? I've learned about myself. But I've got to learn how to say no. My, uh, my desire to please people uh, put me in a position where, where I was working almost exclusively for, for others while trying to maintain control over a vision, the end result of that was just, you know, irritation and frustration and and the family uh, takes the hit on your time and all that sort of stuff. So it's just about streamlining myself. It's, it's not like we can get through it. It's not like there's, it's irreparable, but it was certainly a moment there where I was like, oh, this has to change. And it will. 